Let's talk about some of the details of the rectus abdominis muscle. Rectus abdominis, known popularly, popularly in our culture as abs. Okay, so your abs are referring to the rectus abdominis muscle for the most part. So one thing that's extremely characteristic of the rectus abdominis are what are called tendinous inscriptions. Now the tendinous inscriptions are variable from person to person. They're not like bricks like they make on Halloween costumes or in Marvel movies of superheroes with, with perfect symmetrical bricks. The bricks are actually a little more varied than that. So they might be like this. They might not be exactly the same on either side. Maybe one is going up this way a little bit. Maybe this one's going this way, you know, this way. And, and maybe we'll have another one here. Uh, and it's extremely varied how these present. I've actually drawn them kind of even more, more symmetrical than you might find them in a body. Look at a, look at a video of bodybuilders or something, and you'll see that each individual has very different presentation of the, of the bricks, which are really our folk language for the sections of muscle tissue between the tendinous inscriptions. So we call that a tendinous inscription. Now, what is that? It's fibrous matter. It's, it's, it's not muscle fibers, but rather tendinous matter. So the muscle fiber is kind of shorter here than it is here. Here are the muscle fibers from the last inscription to the pubic bone and the, these, these tubercles and the symphysis of the pubic bone where the rectus abdominis an, uh, muscle tissue anchors on either side. There's a long length of, of, the, of the muscle tissue here. And then we have these shorter sections of muscle tissue. And the numbers can vary from three to five, six, seven. It all depends on the person, their height, just whatever endowment they have. It's, it's very variable. And then it anchors up here somewhere. This is also variable. So maybe up to the cartilage of the fifth rib. Let's call this the fifth rib. And we have cartilage associated with the ribs at the, at the midline here, anchoring the rib bone to the sternum bone with cartilage in between. And the rectus abdominis basically anchors up onto this cartilage and onto the sternum, onto the xiphoid process with its central tendon here, which we call the linea alba. So we have tendinous inscriptions as tendinous matter. We have the linea alba running down the middle, meaning the white line because there's no muscle fibers there, so it's just tendinous matter. So the, 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 this is a shorter length of pull than this. So maybe we can get a, a, a bit more uh, force and tension here than in the longer lengths of muscle fibers. I'll also mention that the tendinous inscriptions are only a relationship anteriorly or to the front. So I didn't draw the ensheathment, the rectus sheath, so anteriorly, in front of the muscle tissue, there's a sheath of tendinous matter coming from the abdominal wall musculature uh, to the right and left of center. So the uh, external obliques, the internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis muscle tissues are all contributing tendinous matter to ensheath the central structure of the rectus abdominis. So it really lives in a fascial tube, you might say. It really does because the, all of the layers of the abdominal wall converge in the linea alba. So it's kind of a sturdy, thick line there. And then here they divide and wrap uh, going behind the rectus abdominis and in front of it. So we have what we call the posterior rectus sheath and the anterior rectus sheath. So the anterior rectus sheath is more superficial than the muscle tissue and the posterior rectus sheep sheath is deeper than the rectus abdominis muscle tissue. But the tendinous inscriptions only anchor to the anterior rectus sheath. They don't anchor to the posterior rectus sheath. So the muscle tissue in the back is, is 
having a membranous relationship with the posterior rectus sheath, where it has a tendinous relationship at these points with the anterior rectus sheath. At this point, it's a perifascial membranous relationship all where the muscle tissue is, so that there can be shearing movement of the muscle fibers relative to the sheath. But this provides leverage, so these muscle fibers have a lot of leverage on these fibers. Now, I think the vasculature is an interesting detail about the rectus abdominis. Off of your <laughs> uh, subclavian artery, we have, let me make some artery, artery collars here. Off of the subclavian artery way up here, we have the internal thoracic artery branching. So that comes down this way, and here the artery branches down this way. So we have an artery that's running behind your chest wall. It's also called the mammary artery. And it throws off all kinds of nice branches along here, and I can't draw them all. But basically, when it gets down to the rectus abdominis under the rib cage here, it's going to change its name. We're going to call it that superior epigastric artery. And the superior epigastric artery is going to feed and give oxygen supply to this muscle tissue, all pretty much above the navel. And then from below, off of the external iliac artery, external iliac artery, we're going to have the inferior, inferior epigastric artery, and that's going to branch on the deep side of the muscle tissue, both sides, on the deep side of the muscle tissue, and then it will join up with the internal thoracic branching. So the superior, inferior, uh, epigastric and the superior epigastric are going to join up together around the navel and, and that will cover the whole muscle in oxygen supply, nutrition supply, life supply. So the veins follow the same pattern, the superior and inferior epigastric veins that supply the rectus abdominis. Where do the nerves come from? Well, they kind of conveniently borrow nerves from the from the, the, the spinal nerves coming out from the thoracic vertebrae. So thoracic vertebrae 7 through 12 are all contributing nerve supply to the rectus abdominis. I can sort of draw in little tree branches coming through here. So we have nerve supply coming in laterally in between the layers of the fascia of the abdominal wall you know, sort of borrowed from the intercostal, the in, the, the in between the ribs nerves. So we got nerve supply coming from T7 through 12, but basically T7 through 11 is the motor supply. And then back again to T7 through T12, we have the sensory nerves. So the afferent fibers delivering what? This is like a sense organ, right? We're constantly um, adjusting to our position in space, the tension in the tissues, uh, based on the, the muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs, sensing how much force is being generated. And all that feedback loop is, is coming from the sensory information that's being delivered uh, from, from this uh, muscle tissue. So additionally, uh, I want to speak for a minute about the, the wrappings, those rectus sheaths that I mentioned, the anterior and the posterior, because I think this is interesting. And I did a four-hour lecture on this on my, <laughs> that's on my website, so I'm going to cram it into two minutes here and basically say that the anterior rectus sheath, that's the, the aponeurotic uh, tendinous matter coming from the muscle tissue, the, the, the lateral muscles kind of peter out, and we just have their fascia wrapping the anterior, uh, creating the anterior rectus sheath. And it's thicker at the bottom. There are more layers at the bottom than there are at the top. So the, the ab abdominal, the obliques and the, and the transversus abdominis don't contribute in the same way to the top and to the bottom. So the anterior rectus sheath is thinner up here and thicker down here. And the posterior rectus sheath is the opposite. So the posterior rectus sheath is thinner on the bottom and thicker on the top behind the rectus abdominis. Just an interesting anatomical feature. So you might hear people say that the rectus abdominis dives deep 
and becomes a deeper layer than the other abdominal muscle tissues. And it's, it's true <laughs> the, because the tissue is thicker here. And there's one more feature that I have to add because it's such a fun little thing, which is the pyramidalis muscle. Now, we don't all have a pyramidalis muscle, but for those of us who do, maybe 70% of the population, there's a cute little muscle here that's maybe shaped like a, a little pyramid and it overlays the lower portion of the rectus abdominis muscle, anchors to the pubic bone and pubic symphysis similarly, and then the fibers converge on the linea alba. I just love the pyramidalis muscle because to me I think of it as, as sort of a tuner with the, with the xiphoid process here. Let's make a xiphoid process. So the xiphoid process and the pyramidalis muscle are kind of together an anchor point and, uh, and a muscle tuner of the, of the linea alba. But obviously, we don't all need it. Maybe uh, we're trying to figure out as a species whether we need it or not. Maybe we'll get it up to 100% someday. Maybe we'll drop it all together. Who can say? But those are some details of the rectus abdominis. I'll fill in the, the words over here because I used a lot of vocabulary in this lesson. But it's an interesting, beautiful tissue. And I'll say one more thing, and this is more about our culture. So the, the truth of the matter is, we don't all have transparent bricks like people on magazines who've been photoshopped, or actual athletes who've gone that extra thousand miles to generate that, that, uh, that hard brick look in the belly wall. Now, the relative transparency is different in our species. So in general, I'm saying in general, in the male side of things, we tend to have thinner superficial fascia and thinner deep fascia. And that renders the muscle tissue more transparent. It's a hormonal thing. If we move from this side of the species with a lot of testosterone towards the side of the species with more estrogen and progesterone, we're going to end up with thicker superficial fascia and thicker deep fascia. And those two thicknesses of biological fabrics covering the muscle layer renders the muscle tissue and its definition less transparent. Now, it's possible to, well, you can take uh, steroids and male hormones. I'm not recommending it, but this is what folks will do in order to sort of accelerate the dissolution of the fascial layers and thin them so that the uh, muscle tissue can be more transparent for sport or show or just because it's fun to do. I used to do it. I was a, I was a youthful bodybuilder. Um, now, if you looked at me, you wouldn't see my bricks anymore <laughs> because I'm, I'm uh, older and a little more fleshy. But I'm also, I feel, feel okay with that. And I think all of us can feel okay with that. If you're looking in the mirror and you don't see bricks, uh, there's no cause for shame. Uh, it takes uh, work to build up these muscle tissues. It might not be the work that you're called to do. And also, depending upon your hormonal disposition, it may be that much further out of reach to create this, uh, this sort of magazine look. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to study more with me, go to gilheadley.com. There's a ton of stuff there. Enjoy.